This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Sound Porter Mastering, Adam Audio, OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock. I would say the most important thing is choosing the musicians wisely and getting the best of the best to record your music because they will bring your arrangements, they will bring everything to life. They will almost fix whatever is actually wrong. So I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a good plan. When I was choosing my musicians to work on Mas De Me, it was sort of a similar process, man. I was calling the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I'm Brian Murphy, and I strive to produce masters that move your song emotionally, but maintain the spirit of your mix and the intention of the artist. My promise is to give your music its best sonic performance, not simply change it. You work hard on your mix, and I always want to respect that. My goal is to help you realize how great your mix can be, and I'll work hard to make sure it succeeds. I don't just master, I help your mix sound the best it can. Contact me for a free mastering demo at soundporter.com. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com slash rock stars. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Tony Sukar, a two-time Latin Grammy Award-winning and number one Billboard charting artist, producer, and composer-arranger, born in Lima, Peru, and raised in Miami, Florida. Tony produces music in the world of salsa, jazz, pop, and Afro-Latino-inspired music. He has a Bachelor's of Arts and a Master's degree in jazz performance from Florida International University. And in 2018, Tony was nominated for the prestigious Latin Grammy Awards for Best Tropical Song, Me Enamoro Mas De Ti, if I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully. He received four nominations in 2019 for Album of the Year, Best Tropical Song, Best Salsa Album, and Producer of the Year for his most recent album, Mas De Mi. Which, that, does that mean more of me? Is that what that means? That's yeah, gr- more of me. That's great, man. What a great title. <laughs> Tony took <laughs> home two Latin Grammys for Producer of the Year and Best Salsa Album, making history as the youngest winner to have ever won both categories. Amazing, man. Mas De Mi was released by Tony through his independent label, Unity Entertainment. His inspiration for the album was to write and produce non-traditional songs that will appeal to younger generations. He has also worked with an impressive array of talented artists, including Tito Nieves, India, John Cicada, Mark Anthony, Sheila E., Arturo Sandoval, Judith Hill, and Obi Bermudez, among many others. Tony's debut album, Unity, the Latin tribute to Michael Jackson, had tremendous success, reaching Billboard's number one tropical album music chart in iTunes' number one world Latin chart and Amazon's number one for the Latin pop music chart, among others. It also evolved into a nationally televised primetime PBS special that kicked off the PBS Fall Arts Festival. Tony has performed at the Caribbean Sea Jazz Festival in Aruba, the Ravinia Festival in Chicago, Auditorio Telmex in Mexico, Vivo Beach in Puerto Rico, Tempo Latino in France, and the 2019 Latin Grammy Awards at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, among others. So please welcome Tony Sukar to Recording Studio Rockstars. Tony, are you ready to rock, my friend? I am ready to rock Thank you so much for that epic introduction. You're welcome, <laughs> oh man. Thanks. You're welcome. I mean, it's like a long list of cool stuff that you've done. So 
It's really fun to read it. You know, it's been a a career of um, just a lot of amazing opportunities and a lot of blessings. And I'm just thankful to, to to be fortunate enough to do what I like to do for a living, you know, which is music. It's it's the, really the best. Yeah, well, we're fortunate to have you, man. Your music is really inspiring. Um, h- high energy is a word I would use for a lot of it, too. I know that's not the only style, but, um, you know, the, the music that you make just makes me want to get up out of my chair, you know? Thanks, man. Well, I, you know, I've, I've grew up here in Miami and there's a lot of tropical music. There's a lot of Latin music and I've been a percussionist all of my life. So that's what I try to focus on doing is just how to sort of stay true to my roots and to, to what I grew up. It's what I connect the most. And it makes people want to dance because that's, that's the kind of like atmosphere that I grew up in, you know, Miami, the tropical South beach, the, the, you know, the fire. So, uh, how old were you when you went from Peru to Miami? Well, I was actually two years old when I got to Miami. So I was very young. Um, so that's why I kind of almost grew up here, you know, like obviously thanks to my parents, the Peruvian roots and the Peruvian culture was very engraved in my upbringing. So I, you know, I have that culture engraved in my heart, but, um, I still grew up in Miami with all these different like mixtures of, of, uh, Latino cultures. Um, how, you know, not to get too deep into it, but how different would the Peruvian influence of music be to what you're doing today? Is it very, quite similar or are there real differences? No, there's definitely big time differences. I would say that, um, here in Miami, uh, there's a lot of uh, tropical, like uh, Caribbean type of um, music, right? So we're talking about um, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. So I, I really, I, I focused on those type of sounds because it was there's something about it that really attracted me to it. Now Peruvian music, there's different styles within it, right? There's the African which I do a lot of, by the way, is actually one of the first instruments that I learned how to play is a Peruvian instrument called the cajon, which is like a Peruvian box, wooden box instrument. And, um, but they also have like the Andean and they also have other genres like cumbia, which is um, actually was born in Colombia, but a lot of um, countries like Mexico and obviously Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, they got this really popular rhythm and then they kind of made it their own but i never really got into the cumbia sound so my Mm -hmm. thing is just mainly like the salsa the cuban the puerto rican however i always like to inject the music with a little bit of that peruvian sound like the cajon and different type of andean instruments that i can find to really kind of fuse my culture within um, the tropical music so if i was to ask you to describe what salsa music is how how would you describe that Well, salsa music actually comes from Cuba, right? I would say it's, it's actually a fusion between the Cuban sound, right? This Cuban rhythm called son and, um, the Afro Cuban sort of, um, style, but salsa in essence was sort of, I think more born in New York when all of these different cultures started mixing together. Like the Puerto Ricans, for example, um, started like to, to really, um, embrace this, this style. And it, it became to what we know now as salsa because it had a, it's basically like a sauce, right? So it has a mixture of different ingredients and it has a lot of, like a little bit, a little bit of jazz, a little nice. bit of, um, a little bit of funk, a little bit of even like, you know, I would say soul, like it, it just has all these, t- I, I, I find salsa music, although people, when they hear it, they're like, okay, this is a hundred percent Latino. A lot of like, I think American music has influenced, uh, the way, um, Latinos have, um, sort of produced the music and has sort of evolved. Right. So I would say that right now it's, it's kind of like a, it's just a fusion of different elements. However, I would say the fundamental, rhythm and the underlying rhythm is still Cuban, right? So Mm -hmm. this is still Cuban music. And that's why I always um, pay tribute and homage to to the Cuban culture and to the Cuban roots. And actually went to Cuba 
um, for the first time last year, man. And it was, it was totally amazing. It was, it was incredible. Um, so that's so funny because for me, it's funny when it's a reminder that the answer to a question is right in my face and I didn't even see it. So that's the first time I ever realized that salsa the, that you might eat would, is the same salsa that is describing the, the uh, mix of these different musical styles, and yet it's so obvious, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny, though, but whoever, you know, invented that word is really thought about it because it's kind of like the only way to sort of describe it. It's, it's salsa. It, it's got a flavor, right? Um, and, and the only way to really make a sauce is just kind of like putting together different things and adding a little bit of salt, a little, a little of this. And um, this, this, this genre of music, and I've played all sorts of genres of music and um, I grew up also listening to a lot of jazz and I went to school for jazz music as well. But man, there's something about it that really, it, it does it for me, you know? It, that's, that's the thing that really clicks and I don't get that feeling by playing any other genre but just this. Yeah, well, it's pretty evident just watching you play this music on your videos because you just have a permanent smile on your face. You know, you just look as happy yeah. as can be. Um, and let's see, one of the videos I was just watching was the um, the Billie Jean Timbales video. And oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just like a, a five and a half minute performance of you playing your part on the Timbales with to the full arrangement of the song with just all kinds of hits and punches and everything. And I don't see a sheet of music in front of you. You just got your eyes closed and you're smiling. And you're just nailing every single thing. I imagine. Yeah. How, how well, do you do that? I mean, you just did, you just memorize it. You just uh, a lot of rehearsal. Well, I I act, I wrote the arrangement, so that makes it a lot easier for sure. <laughs> you know, so when that's the thing with me, man. I actually hate reading music. I I I hate reading music, and whenever I perform, I try to never read music. And there's two reasons for that. One of the reasons is because. I feel like I can't execute the music at, at the fullest potential because I'm concentrated on, you know, on just the, 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 what's on the sheet of paper. And second is because I can't really see that well, you know, like <laughs> I, I usually use like, I, for example, I don't know how to, I can't put contacts in my eyes. Like I, I get irritation and so I have to use glasses. And so when I perform the problem with these, glasses because I sweat a lot. I get all foggy in my glasses. Huh. So there's really no way for me to read. You know, it's kind of like, it's almost, I guess, if I'm like, you know, blind or something, I just, you know, so then I try to really internalize every arrangement. Um, yeah. And one of the benefits to writing the arrangement is that you'll really internalize it to the max because you'll know exactly what every single little thing is going on within the song. So when you see it like um, a video like that, it's it's me doing that in my sleep, you know. I'm, I'm I'm. It's literally no effort. It's it's just fun. It's complete and 100% fun. That's great, man. You know, uh, I have a cousin who also had very poor eyesight, and I remember watching him when he was young. He got up at a family wedding, and he recited his toast from speech, and it was perfect. It was incredible, you know. And I just thought like. Wow, how did he perfectly memorize this whole thing? <laughs> and it was he said the exact same thing. He's like, Well, I have I've always had to because I can't see very well. So I couldn't have read it if it was in front of me anyway. That's great. Wow, that's hilarious, man. <laughs> yeah. So um, all right, well, cool. So tell us a little bit about your um, you know, you you kind of gave us some insight into your background. Anything you more more that you want to talk about um going from music into producing at this level that you're at now, if you want to give us kind of a brief overview of, of how you got into this stuff? Yeah, of course. Well, I actually got into um, music because of my parents. So I started off playing instruments in my house, thanks to my dad having so many instruments, you know, like he, he was a piano, but you know, obviously he had like an upright piano in the house keyboards all over the place but he would also have a bunch of other instruments like there was a drum set there was congas there was timbales there was a lot of percussion there was a bass there was a trumpet he just loved to collect the instruments although he was not able to play them but he just loved to have them and he kind of fiddled around with like a guitar and stuff like that so um, at a very young age 
when when people would come to my house, you know, my my mom would be singing, my dad would be playing the piano or not, and then they'll have like occasionally like you know a friend or a cousin or somebody just jump on another instrument. And so little by little, I just started to start picking up percussion because for me it was kind of like the easiest one, right? That everything else was kind of like too difficult. So I was just a very rhythmic type of kid. And then uh, fast forward when I um, when I turned 13 years old, it was kind of like um, a chore, right? So you had to play with the family band. So my mom, my sister was the singer, and then my mom sang. My dad played the piano, and then we had a bunch of other people in the band. And then my dad was like, "Okay, well it's time for you to actually start playing with us. So what do you want to play?" And then I was like, "Okay, I'll play the drums." So then I started playing with them in like um, you know weddings and um, birthday parties and all sorts of private uh, so occasions. Great. Like that's what. Yeah, that's, that's what so they great. did. So that's how I sort of got into it. And then I never really took music, though, like a profession and say like it was for me always a hobby because I always looked at my parents as like what I don't want to do in the future. Right. Because it was like the gig life. So I would have to like and it was kind of a chore. Right. So you, I had to go to the gigs and I had to like, you know, connect all the speakers and carry all the speakers and <laughs> put them in the trailer. And it was, you know, all the drums. I that's the one thing I hated about the drums, you know, the kick and all the toms and all the hardware. And you can imagine there was a lot of times where, you know, they, they had like gigs in the backyard and I had to like carry everything through the grass. I mean, it was just awful. I was yeah. like, this is the worst job ever. You're like, Dad, so, why are you always just talking to the host over at the bar? I'm carrying the drums here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, that's why I never really wanted to become a professional musician. I always said, you know what? I want to be a professional soccer player. But for the time being, you know, my my dad will pay me like, you know, $30 a gig. And then he went up to like 50. And then, and then eventually I started getting 100, 150 bucks. And I was like, man, this is pretty good money for me. You know, I have friends that are working at McDonald's for $7 an hour. And I'm at least, you know, having a decent time and making a pretty... So it was like a, it was like my you know, my high school job or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's how it all started really. But then when I actually graduated high school and had to choose a career in college, that's when it all clicked to me. And I actually, I found myself not liking really anything. You know, I tried to take, you know, they have like a test to see what major you should take. Um, and I was kind of like undecided. I, I wanted to play soccer, but then, you know, I didn't have the right opportunity, the right team to play for. Um, I didn't want to go like travel to another state. So, you know, I was just kind of like limited to the ones around me, you know, mm -hmm. the colleges around me. And then, so, uh, my dad decided to just tell me, Hey, Tony, why don't you just randomly audition for the school of music and see if you like it. And you, you never know. And I was like, dad, are you serious? I don't want to be a poor musician. You know, like I want to, I want to be rich. <laughs> you know, <so> then, <laughs> He was like, it was like, Tony, you never know what can happen. At least maybe if you if you audition, maybe you can get like a partial scholarship and that's more money in your pocket, you know? Mm -hmm. So I said, you're right, you know? I'll look at it as like a little side gig. So when I auditioned, um, I luckily I, I passed the audition and everything and they offered me a partial scholarship. But it was contingent upon me actually majoring in music. So I was... You know, I said, you know what, I'll take the scholarship, I'll major in music. And then, you know, I would, I would always look at like, you know, interviews of like Steve Jobs where he didn't go to college or, you know, everybody was like, college is not that important. I said, you know what, college, I'll do it for music because, you know, I'll get the, I'll get the extra income with the scholarship, but um, I'm still want to create my own company and then be an entrepreneur and, and be rich. Right. So that right, was like right, right. the whole thing. It was like, cause you know, when you're young, you just, you you kind of especially if you come from a very humble home you kind of like you kind of want to do the opposite of what your parents did so you don't have to go through those struggles because I I grew up with major major money struggles you know it was right, really right. tough growing up you know food stamps and all that like it was just my dad had to work three jobs and he he came from le leaving his career in Peru right as a as a merchant marine like he had it all he was a banker he did it and then he came here to literally start cleaning bathrooms wow. and, you know, doing this from, from scratch because he just knew that it was going to be a better future for my sister. Um, and I, and my brother, you know, my sister ended up going to Harvard, you know, she's a very successful orthodontist. Um, wow. you know, I became a really successful musician and my, my brother is also a very successful 
a DJ producer. So I actually have to thank my my dad in particular because he's the one who sacrificed everything, but uh, for us. But yeah, that's kind of like my my little story, you know, how actually music just became my life because after I decided to major in music, I started really loving it. And and then I decided that I really wanted to take it seriously. That's so cool. What an inspiring story, man. That's really great to hear that whole thing. Do you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of recording studio rock stars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice D-Noise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on my voice. If you want great, consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. The secret to great sounding bass in your mix is to start with a great recording. If you've got an awesome part, player, and instrument, then all you need next is to plug that into the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 through the C610 comp limiter, and you've got an incredible bass tone that goes all the way down. The BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I have ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No height, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. You know, I like to ask guests on the show to share an inspirational quote or to talk about anybody particular that has inspired them. Is there anybody that comes to mind for you, you know, as far as inspiring yeah. you through music and all that? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot, lot of um, different um, musicians that have always inspired me since the beginning, like the great Tito Puente. I would say he's the most inspirational to me. And actually it was thanks to thanks to one of the, um, courses that I was taking in college that I had to do a like a biography type of project on his career. And I didn't really do that during my upbringing because again, when when I really got passionate to, mu- to, to the music, it was actually during college. Before that, it was like a hobby and it was it was like it was just a part of my everyday. So when I started to really dig deep as to find out who this guy was, it it really inspired me to become not only a percussionist, but also an arranger and a producer. And I Mm -hmm. think that that was the key to my success, because to be honest with you, when I when I got into the university, I was probably one of the the least talented percussionists there um, and drummers. Right. There, There was there was people that were very high level. And it was because, you know, they had more opportunities to private lessons and stuff like that. And remember, I was I was doing the gig life, so I wasn't really technically savvy or anything. But I did have so much music that I had played. And not only like Latin music, but I'm talking about like anything, you know, Cool in the Gang, UB40, whatever. Right. You know, I was just playing every, every genre of music because we're a cover band. So I had a very strong sense of sensitivity to to songwriting, to what makes the people dance. We were, you know, the thing with the wedding band is that you're like the, you're like a, a live DJ, right? So you have to make the people dance and have a good time. So that, that being said, Tito Puente was this guy that was a master percussionist, but he dedicated his career to writing great arrangements and writing great songs and being a band leader and knowing how to manage his career and create a brand of himself. So that is exactly my footsteps because I'm not a singer, right? Tito Puente wasn't a singer either. I mean, Tito Puente was a timbali player, you know, and that's what I play, the timbalis. Um, He was also a producer and arranger. I'm a producer and arranger. So that's kind of like the, the, uh, you know, the apex of, of the career that I've, I've, eventually want to have you know i think that i'm just following his footsteps he had a credit over like 2000 arrangements during his career he recorded over 100 albums you know i mean carlos wow. santana covered his song oye como va and made him like one of the success, most successful songs in in all of latin music history and so that's where i want to go you know i feel like i'm super far away but he's probably the, the most inspirational musician aside from other guys like quincy jones and even guys out of the music like Bruce Lee is like, you know, with the whole discipline and right, be like yeah. water, you know, and try to like, try to like be really, um, cause in this industry, um, it's very, 
it's very competitive and you have to be able to mold yourself to how the industry is constantly changing with the whole social media thing now TikTok and you know being this like super charismatic person that that can really engage a younger audience all that stuff comes into play and so that's what I'm trying to focus on now too yeah now what about uh, uh this might sound like an odd question but what about Frank Zappa was he ever an influence for you as an arranger Frank Zappa was an yeah for sure and and uh, like for me I would say that um you know there's a lot of band leaders, composers, and multi multi instrumentalists that have, you know, inspired me to become who I am. Because again, it it doesn't have to do with just the Latin music. You know, Frank Zappa with his guitar and stuff like that. You know, Santana, um, Edgar and, and Winter, just, Edgar Winter, Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So he rocks out on the Timbali solo right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's it's all about um, listening to as many sort of different genres of music as you can. And and at the end of the day, you're not going to know everybody. You know, you're just gonna you're gonna really reflect everybody that sort of touched you in some way or shape or form in your music. There's nothing that you can really create from scratch at this point. <laughs> but what you can do is that you can get inspiration from all these different genres and musicians and create your own formula that will eventually sound different because of the way you approach the music and the way you execute a production. There's just so many little factors um, that come into play uh, musically, sonically, you know, lyrically. There's just so many um, variables and that is what's the beauty of music itself yeah. is that it will never get old. So now you play lots of instruments as well, or do you strictly play timbales? I mean, talk to us a little bit about how it is that as a timbale player, you can arrange an entire song when there's horns and bass and piano and guitars and singing and all that stuff. How does that work? Right. Well, again, so thanks to my dad uh, being a piano player and having a piano in the house, I was always really passionate about um, the piano as well. Although I never really de dedicated myself to playing it because again, when I actually, when I was in middle school and I left this part out because I felt like it was going to be too long the story, but I actually majored in piano in, in my middle school, my instrument actually. Um, it wasn't percussion. Although I played more percussion than piano, but my dad was like, Tony, you should actually try to do the piano because he knew that it was going to be a, an instrument that was, you know, it, it's, it's a more complete instrument. So yeah. um, I majored in piano for those three years and I played classical. But then in that time, I had a very terrible teacher in school, music, uh, uh, piano teacher. She actually traumatized me, man. It was like so <laughs> bad that I didn't want to play the piano ever again type of thing. Like it was... You know, those type of teachers that for some reason, if you don't come prepared, they'll like humiliate you in front of people. You know what I mean? Like they'll, they'll, they'll make it a point because for some reason, I feel like that some teachers in music, they are angry at life because maybe they couldn't have, they couldn't make it in their music career. So they lash out a lot of their internal anger without even realizing it mm. to their students. And that is actually really bad because a teacher at the end of the day needs to know their responsibility as a teacher, you know, and, and, you know, you, by, by humiliating somebody at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're removing them from what potentially could be an amazing, uh, career. You know, you just never know, you, you, you can, you can never know when the correct time is for that. So that's what happened. But thanks to, thanks to that preparation is that when I actually got into college, um, when I took the, you know, music theory courses, jazz, piano, all the basic piano classes that you need to take and arranging big band for me, it was, everything was so simple because I already knew all the scales. I had chops, I had, you know, done hand in and, and I, they were all under my fingers already. And I could picture the piano every time I would take a test and I would have to do like, you know, music theory and sight singing. I, re I, I knew the piano inside out. So that is a that was a very big thing for me when actually dedicating myself to become an arranger. So I actually play the piano um, and a whole bunch of like 
you know, percussion instruments that entail not only the Latin percussion side, which is the bongos, the cajon, you know, all that stuff. I, I do play drum set as well. And I also play classical percussion, where it's a snare drum, a timpani, um, marimba, vibraphone. Now, you, you that's can't what my daughter's or- doing now. She's she's learning uh, percussion in the school band. Oh, that's so cool, man. I mean, for me, some of my best memories come from playing in orchestra just because of like, I guess it, it it's fun, you know, to to be able to play a crash cymbal and you know and feel that that like um, that big responsibility, you know, where where you're just you're waiting all the like, right. like 80, <laughs> 80 measures of breast, and then all of a sudden you're just like blah, you know. You just get to it's hit one fun. thing. That's you so get to wild. hit one thing. So so you have like all your friends, right? So a lot of the times, like in the orchestra that are playing like either oboe or whatever the instrument that they're practicing hours and hours and then you're just like yeah i didn't practice anything but you could still sight read it and play it you know and it's like so you're inside of this awesome monstrous band but you're like musically speaking you know you're you're as important but you know that it's not like you know percussion is not this instrument where it's like i feel at least in my opinion unless unless you're already starting to play like crazy orchestral like snare drum and you know and symphonic band which I never actually got the opportunity to do. You know, I was always kind of like the pit guy, you know, playing auxiliary percussion because that was like extremely difficult. So it's cool. You find you find your position in your in the in the orchestra and you kind of make it the best, you know, as you can. But I always had a blast in orchestra rehearsals and band camp and stuff like that. That's cool. My brother has a music school in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Music Factory, and he teaches he's a pianist as well. And you know, watching him with his teaching style, I, I totally understand what you're talking about, about, you know, the instilling a love of music into your students um, coming up rather than a fear of a fear of music, you know. Um, and then also, when you're talking about the really complex percussion stuff, it reminds me of the stories that he told me about um, touring. I think he got to do some circus gigs, and he said the the drummer was the most insane musical gig he'd ever seen just like the all the crazy hits and everything that have to happen on that when you're at that top level of of having to read the music and do all this um you know like you said it's like uh, auxiliary percussion but but accompanying what's going on on the stage yeah it, it gets it's a you know everything has an art to it and every musician has their own like sort of forte and characteristic. And that is something that I've learned as a producer is that it's it's really truly amazing like to be able to like create a song, for example, in a production and and sort of choose the right musicians for the for the particular project, the particular song that you're actually working on. And and the choice of musicians can make a very big difference in the yeah. in the actual outcome of the whole song. So um tell us, let's let's transition to uh, bringing us up to now. I mean, tell us a little bit about your studio. I've seen studios in the videos of you doing these performances. I don't know if that's your studio or if you typically go to a studio when it's time to record. And if so, you know, is there a different kind of studio that that is your home studio that allows you to do all this composition and arranging? What What do we want to know about your studio setup? Yeah, well, the the ones that you see in my videos with all the lights and stuff, that's my studio. It's in actually uh, my parents' house. It's, it's in the garage. I built it with my dad. Um, and I actually built it in order to record um, my Grammy-winning album, Mas de Mi. So the first album that I recorded in there won two Latin Grammys. So that was a pretty cool thing. Amazing. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. This is, yeah. We should all and do that, that, was, that right was... after we build our home studios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was... It was a blessing, man, because I didn't really expect it. And it's such a great story, you know, like, and um, I'm actually coming out with a documentary early next year about the whole process um, of how I got to the Grammys and, and, you know, speaking about the whole story of how, like, I built this studio and all. And it was, it's a great chapter in there because we put in so much love and I was actually going to hire a company to do it, but it was so expensive that I decided to do my own research online and talk to a couple friends and start, you know, tearing stuff down and demolition and building the studs and doing everything with my dad. He had some construction experience and we, you know, we did the whole nine, you know, 
the whole green glue and the double drywall. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun experience. And I think a lot of that had to do with the energy that's actually there now. So I really enjoy producing out of there. I don't like to record anywhere else. And unless it's, unless it's something that you really need like a big room for or something then, um, but I record everything in there recently. And I'm working with like, you know, all the labels right now, I just did something for Interscope and, um, they're very impressed with the sound that I'm getting out of the studio. And it's, it's awesome because it's in the garage of my parents' house. And but a lot of the pre-production stuff I do my, I have an apartment, you know, I live in, um, probably five minutes away, uh, with my wife and I have my little, small little room in here. And that's where I do all my pre-production work. Mm -hmm. And really for a pre-production work, all I really need is my laptop, a little MIDI keyboard and my drive with all my sounds. And that's, that's truly all I need in order to, to make it, um, you know, to make it work. Now, and when you're arranging. Do you ever start with the timbales as the first thing you lay down in an arrangement? Or is that almost always the last thing that you play, you know, when you're arranging yeah. anyway? Actually, to be honest with you, the timbales is the, is the last instrument that I ever record in every song that I do. Right. On. And the reason being is the timbales in the format that I play it, it's kind of like the last pass, you know, it's kind of like the last paint like just the finish and i want to make sure that everything is pristine and clear and i hit all the hits because sometimes when you're recording um you'll find yourself like maybe adding a horn line or adding a horn hit somewhere and you want to be able to like actually you know um hit it if you want it with this team bali so that's why i always do it last um and in the ranging process i write out everything in finale um, but prior to writing everything out, the whole arrangement of the orchestration, I program everything. I used to use back then, I used to use uh, propeller head reason to wow. program. Yeah. And then I, I, I moved on to just using the sounds in reason and then programming in, um, digital performer. And then from there I moved on to logic and then from Logic, now I'm into just programming everything within Pro Tools now and just recording in Pro Tools. So, because it's where everybody has, you know, the studios. And I found that although there's some things that you would find to do a little faster, maybe in other programs, I feel like the, re the reliability and just keeping everything in the same sort of uh, software, it makes it just easier to make easier to deal, yeah. a change and do whatever you need to do. Yeah, you know? so let me ask you this, because I, um, I might be totally wrong about this description, but I mm -hmm. always felt like when I was messing around with Reason, whatever I came up with was very stiff sounding. And maybe it was just because I didn't know how to use swing quantizing and things like that. But is there anything to that? Did you find that going from different platform to platform and ending up on Pro Tools allowed you to somehow loosen up with the MIDI arrangement and things like that? Or am I just making that up? No, you're you're right. I mean, I feel like Reason, it, you know, it did sound stiff. And now that you put it to me, it, it sounded, you know, it didn't at the end of the day um, mess up with the end product because I, I re-record everything anyways. Yeah. But, but it did, like my demos definitely sounded a lot more like stiff and um like on the grid you know, right? uh, rigid yeah really really quantized to the maximum and the sounds the sounds were good um uh, but it was hard to bring in other samples or bring in loops from other places it was just like it was really dedicated to its own thing and although there was like a billion re repack uh sounds and you can buy more and all that stuff and there was like hundreds of thousands of sounds. I felt like the, you, the the platform itself, it was a little weird, you know, and then you press the tab button and then you got like all the cables in the back. And that was, just, like, I, loved, to I always stuff. loved that though. It was so cool when we saw that. We're like, yeah. look at the cables, man. That's so cool. <laughs> it was, it was really neat. 
but I I hate cables myself, you know. Yeah, so I was right. like, why are you bringing cables to a cable, <laughs> a cableless place? I was like, stop with the cables, madness. Gosh, That's funny man. That's funny. Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your tracks stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the U.S. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. All right, cool. Let me see if I can get us back on track here. Um, so now talk about doing, um, you know, Mas de Mi and uh, Me Anamoro Mas de Ti. Yeah. Did I pronounce that right? So, yes, perfect. Okay, Spanish good. 101. <laughs> <laughs> yep, indeed. That's, that's awesome. So the song Me Enamoro Mas de Ti is, a, is the first single that I worked on, on um, to actually create the album. So I didn't know that I was going to create the album until the success of that first single. Okay. And we launched that first single 2018. Um, it was a song that I wrote, I co-wrote with my great friend, Sean Rodriguez, which is a singer on the track and also a great songwriter, very seasoned songwriter, um, almost like a hall of famer in the Latin world. His name is Jorge Luis Piloto. And the, the whole way that came about was very, very, um, very cool because when I, when I launched my project Unity, which is a Latin tribute to Michael Jackson, yeah. um, it took us like four or five years to, to actually put the whole thing in, and, and release it with Universal. We did a whole PBS special. It was just a giant project. And everybody that was like sort of in the industry saw the project as like, wow, this is, this is definitely like going to at least get nominated to a Grammy, you know, it's going to be really good. So when we launched that album, I kid you not, it was crazy. But um, when we got the ballots to vote for the Latin Grammys, my album wasn't there. And, you know, I was wondering, I was like, oh my gosh, did Universal forget to submit it or something? So I called the, the label and they said, no, Tony, this is crazy. I mean, we submitted it. It should at least be on the ballot to vote for, for a pre-nomination, you know, like something like just everybody gets on the, on the ballot because it's just your right as a, as a voting member and stuff and the album, you know, supposed to qualify because it's a full length album. It was mm -hmm. launched in the dates. So I contacted the Gram the Latin Grammys and then they got back to me and they said, Oh, Tony, well, we didn't tell you, but your album was disqualified. And I said, what? Like wow. after four or five years, how can that be disqualified? And they said, yeah, well, the issue with your album is that, you know, it has a little bit too much English and needed a little bit more like Spanish in order for it to be considered a Latin album. And then, wow. you know, everybody was like, what? And I was like, I can't even believe what I'm hearing right now. Like, how are you going to like, how is this even true? So they say, well, there's rules, you know, and the rules is that you have to have 51% of the lyrics in Spanish and you have like 47%. So, and I was like, what? Like, how do you even time? <laughs> what do you, how do you even like calculate this? Right. How do you time? How do you count these words? Like, you know, uh, that's crazy. So I fought that, man. I fought that back and I got super mad. And I actually did a video on Facebook. It went viral inside of the Latin uh, Grammy committee. It was actually very, very, um, uh, it was a crazy time for me, man. It was like yeah. a very moment of downfall. But then at the end of the day, um, they, they didn't accept my album, but the actual president of the Latin Grammys contacted me and I met with him actually. So it was nice of him to to take his time to to meet with me. And I tell you this story because I want to sort of put it in context. So when the president of the Latin Grammys uh, meets me, he's like, Tony, man, I, I really feel for you because I really love the album. I think it was, you know, if you would have gotten um, at least passed through the first round, you would have for sure won, um, at least gotten nominated, you know, because the album was so good. However, there's nothing we can do at this point. You know, the committee decided that it's not allowed to be a part of the um, awards. So just move forward. But he said, the good thing is that now everybody really knows about you and your album because your video that you put on Facebook went viral. And be just because of the curiosity, people are listening to your record now inside hmm. of the Academy. Hmm. So that was actually really cool 
for him to say. And he said, you know what, Tony, I'm going to put you in contact with this guy, Jorge Luis Piloto, which is a great songwriter because he told me, he was like, I feel like you should do an album that concentrates now on your original compositions rather than the covers because people only know you for the covers. So I said, thanks, man. And, and I took that advice. And so when I went with Jorge Luis Piloto, he's the one who actually was like my Yoda, you know, he's like the, the sort of the Jedi master. And he was like, Tony, what you need to do is that we need to write salsa music as if we were writing to Michael Jackson, the salsero, like the Michael Jackson is now a salsa artist. Like what would he sing if he was singing this genre, right? Cause this is what people know you for this type of R and B pop, soul, rock, funk, and so we started writing songs and this is Men Amor Tomati was the first song. And if you really listen to that song, that melody has nothing to do with salsa music. If I remove that arrangement, you can easily play in like a rock funk format because the melody is very, very, you know, pop and, you know, kind of rock. So mm -hmm. um, that sort of opened the doors for us because that first, that first, first uh, single that we released got nominated for a Latin Grammy as a... Um, best tropical song. And so that was crazy because it was my first Latin Grammy nomination. And then that's when everybody was like, okay, you know what? This is the formula. And that is what gives us the stepping stone to work on the entire album. I ended up writing like seven songs with Piloto on the record. And then I wrote with some other guys. And then I threw in two also um, like MJ songs in the mix, just because I wanted to like sort of please my my current, you know, MJ fans, because mm -hmm. I had a lot of them. And then, and then boom, that album came out in May, Mas de Mi. And then in October, I got the four nominations completely independently, which was crazy. I was the only independent album uh, nominated for album of the year because it's such a competitive category. Um, you know, producer of the year, like super random. Like it was like, wow, how is this? And then I ended up winning producer of the year. And, and best also album. I was like, it's crazy. <laughs> I love it, man. I love hearing that, you know, success story where you you basically get shut down completely and then you fight back for the win. I went through something very similar to that this past year in um in the effort to save home studios here in Nashville. Cause my sh my studio got shut down in 2015 um by codes for not being allowed as a working studio and a residence in Nashville of all places. And then over a five-year period, we fought back, and then we just we won and changed the legislation last year. So, different story, but same kind of like, you know, don't don't give up, come back and 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 win. You know, so love hearing that story from you. Oh um, man, thanks, bro. Yeah, so that's so great. Now, um, you were talking about selecting the right musicians, and um, what were some of the things that you chose to do as far as? picking the best musicians and making sure, or like what lessons did you learn about that in making this record? Well, you know, I, I started learning about that um, during the Michael Jackson album because before the Michael record, I really had no production experience. Like this was my first real uh, record that I was doing. And luckily I have a lot of friends and one of them, um, happened to be a very successful producer. And he told me a good advice that stuck to me. He said, Tony, the most, I would say the most important thing is choosing the musicians wisely and getting the best of the best to record your music because they will bring your arrangements. They will bring everything to life. They will almost fix whatever is actually wrong. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a good plan. So because of that experience that I had with Unity, when I was choosing my musicians to work on Mas de Mi, it was sort of a similar process, man. I was calling the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and the guys that I knew were going to deliver my type of sound, which is guys that had experience not only recording a lot of salsa music, but were sort of all around because I wanted to also incorporate different instruments that are like very, um, I would say, um, not too common in the salsa format, right? So we're talking about instruments like a talk box, for example. They use a lot in R and B, you know, Stevie Wonder style. Um, there's a song that yeah. I start with, like that that 24 karat magic type type of vibe. That in a salsa song has never ever been heard or done, you know. And that was one of the things that sort of really resonated in my album. A lot of electric guitar as well, a lot of funky wah type of sounds. 
Um, and just a lot of world music type instruments as well. You know, throw in some strings, throw in, you know, some like Uru drum, which is like a little bit Middle Eastern. Yeah, and so, one. yeah, it, it's, it's a very, very diverse album. And there was over 80 musicians that have that recorded on the album on distinct tracks. We recorded almost everything in my studio. However, there was things that I couldn't record there, like the strings. Um, I also recorded some stuff in Peru because I wanted to get a little bit of a more authentic, you know, sound. And that comes to say again, why it's so important to get the right guys to perform the music. And I knew that I was not going to be able to find it in Miami or anywhere in the United States. So I had to go to the source. Same thing with going to the source in, in Cuba for a very specific uh, bata um, type of um, conversation that I wanted to do with the drums. And I used a, a very folkloric group to record that over there. Um, wow. I also did stuff in Puerto Rico. I did stuff you know, uh, and then obviously in Miami. So it was a combination of, of different locations to get, um, and, and put every, all of it, all of it together. So now in honor of, um, Christopher Walken and Will Ferrell, I do have to ask you one really tough question though. Um, do you sometimes feel that despite all these other cool instruments you're adding, that you have a fever and the only prescription for this fever is just more cowbell? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that is the most <laughs> epic thing ever, man. And, oh my god, I'll never forget that. And for sure, dude, one of the most, you know, my my mixing engineer always tells me he's like, I always, you know, whenever he has the mix where he has it, he always adds two dB to the cowbell because he knows that <laughs> I'm gonna say it. You know, he's be like, be like, he's uh, he knows I'm gonna pick up the phone and be like, yo, just. Even if it's a psychological thing, I'll just tell them, give me half a dB. You know, you can't really hear half a dB up, but I'll just say it anyways, just because it's a psychological thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. When it comes to cowbell, we need more cowbell. <laughs> you need more cowbell for sure. <laughs> a gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you. And if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. Uh, my guest today is Tony Sukar, joining us from Miami, talking about making Grammy-winning salsa records. Uh, are you ready to jam, Tony? I'm ready to rock and roll. Are you ready to rock and roll? All right, cool, man. <laughs> uh, and what would you say? I mean, would you guys, do you say, are you ready to rock if you're going to make salsa music, or is there some other expression you would use? Well, you know, I, you know, we're, we're here in the States, man, and so like we, all of us, speak you know fluent english and stuff so it, it's just the same we're always I, I you know and i love rock and roll and i love the energy behind yeah. it and actually bro when i play timbales i i'm i feel like a like a rock drummer i'm always breaking sticks you know and i'm like 
you know, I have I, I forget about all technique at that point. I'm just like going hardcore. And so that's 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 what I always say, man. God, I'm ready to rock and roll. I love it, dude. Hey, you know, I thought of another artist that you might appreciate. Um, I was thinking about, you know, you breaking sticks, but I'm also thinking about how you just have this infectious smile on your face the whole time. You know, just this big, big grin while you're playing. Are you familiar with Papa Joe Jones? You know, the the drummer. Um, I don't know what era it was, like 20s, 30s, something like that. I think it's jazz, right? J- yeah, jazz. He's a great jazz drummer. Great yeah, jazz yeah, drummer. Yeah, for sure. He always had this incredible smile on his face while he did these just wicked drum solos, you know? Yes, yes, yeah. I know who you're talking about exactly, man. No, no, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an awesome thing that I could be in the same sentence, you know? Absolutely, <laughs> so, dude. Absolutely. Well, at least, at least. I may not be as good as him, but maybe we have we can compete in the smile category. <laughs> hey, as long <laughs> as everybody leaves feeling good after the gig. So um, we were talking For about sure. this a little bit off off mic. Um, so I'll bring it up again. I made the cowbell joke. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for running with me on that one. But originally, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about clave too, and then and then I realized when I watched the videos, I I didn't see a clave. I saw you playing the cowbell more. And so my question to you, which you started to answer was, you know, what is the meaning of cowbell versus clave in salsa music and the Latin music you're creating? And how important are those elements? Right. So the clave to me is, is the key of salsa music and the key sort of to all like tropical music, really. And you know, in traditional, um, like this tropical music, you'll hear the clave play, being played, you know, in a traditional format. But as as time started, you know, and the and the actual genre um, started to like grow into something else and and be fused with different elements, they stopped playing the clave inside. But however, the clave is always felt. So you you maybe you can't hear it, but you should be able to feel it. And it's and that's how every musician um, on stage or in the studio interpreting the music will always be able to feel the clave in the right format. So there's there's two different ways. There's the two, three clave and the three, two clave, right? This, and, and it's just basically the way how a pair of two measures are like, you know, paired up, you know, they can be either like two, three, or they could be three, two. Like, and, and that has to do with the cadence of the actual melody. And then every musician plays to that cadence and to that particular groove, you know. So that's the actual really, really interesting part. Okay. Of, and what, uh, what is a clave, too? In case somebody doesn't even know what that is yet. Well, a clave is an actual instrument, right? We're talking about the instrument, the clave. Feel it, it's like two wooden sticks, basically, and looks like um, almost like two cl- uh, cowbell beaters, you know, very thick pieces of wood, and it makes the sound goes. You know, it, you yeah, know, it just like that, and it's um, it, and like I said, it it's basically the key. It's the the thing, the underlying um, ah, it's secret like that. It just it's in the music embedded, and you can't even you can't even get away from it. You know, and whenever you sing a melody, you have to be able to do it with the clave, and it has to feel good. If not, then it's it's wrong. You know, and there's actually people like in Puerto Rico and like the purists, and we call them the clave police, bro. And if something is actually uh-huh. recorded out of clave or out of groove, man, they will come after you and they'll make your living hell until you bring down your song for Spotify and retire of life. Wow, <laughs> you know, it's like, the clave police. They'll, they'll be the trolls. Clave police, the trolls, man, they'll troll you down. So you got to be very careful when, you, when you're going to do salsa music and everything like that, make sure you consult with somebody that is an expert in this, because you don't, the last thing you want to do is to be, you know, on the wrong side of clave. But you'll kind of notice, man. I mean, anybody that has groove will really notice because it it will feel wrong. It'll just feel weird. You yeah, know, it's just like playing something reggae. About it will feel. It's like when people play reggae yeah. on the one and the three instead of the. Or no, let's see what. Oh, now I can't even yeah, say they, it right. When they play it on the wrong yeah, beat, like, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no wrong beat exactly. <laughs> Um, okay. So yeah, consult the clave. Um, do you think that the clave beat, um, and different musical styles are ultimately connected to a dance itself and the movement of the human body? And that's where it comes from. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, everything is connected, right? So, um, the dance is connected to the rhythm and the rhythm is connected to the dance. 
I don't know historically what comes first. I mean, you can't do one without the other, right? Because you can't just play and nobody dance. You know what I mean? Like, wh- I mean, it's not, it's not inspirational like that, you know, mm-hmm. like there's, and it's all part of like the tradition. So, um, and a lot of times um, the, the, the way of communicating with the drums, the vocabulary that you use is actually dictated by the dance itself. So like, for example, in Peru, there's a, a particular rhythm called festejo. And the festejo, um, there's always a part in the song where, where all harmonic instruments just stop playing and it's only percussion. And this is the moment in time in the song where the, where the singer actually goes to the middle of the stage or, or whatever and just starts kind of like improvising a choreography. And in the percussion, the conga player has to mark all of those hits that the the sing the singer's doing in her choreography. And mm-hmm. it's like just a must. It's part of the tradition. So all of those like conversations that you have with the drums, they're all going towards and sort of um coloring the the, the musical spectrum um by moves and dance moves of the actual dancer. So it's yeah. pretty cool. It's a coordinated dance between the drum and the and the person dancing. Yes. Um that's cool, man. So l- l- let me also ask you about the timbali kit when you play. What is, what are the actual elements in a timbali kit, and um, what um, what uh, ha- well, what are some ways that you like to mic up your timbali kit so that you can capture it? Because I know for somebody like me, if somebody brought one into the studio, I'd be like, "Oh, cool, we're going to do this," and I have no idea how to record it. You know, right? Well, you know, the timbales is an instrument that it's very important to mic correctly, especially in the salsa format, because you can easily mic it wrong and then you won't have that same punch. You gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta think of, of the, of the timbales. And actually you gotta think about the whole rhythm section per- percussion wise, like the congas, you have the bongos, you have a guido, you have a maraca, you have a cowbell, and then you have the timbales. And all of this has to function as if it was one drum set player. So everybody has to sort of communicate with each other musically, but also in the mix, it's got to be all panned nicely so that you get one full stereo image of just a monstrous groove, right? So um, in the sense of where the timbales come about, a lot, of, a lot of times engineers will just be like, oh, just put like two overheads on it and that's it because they'll have a, like, they'll have a, an idea as to the timbales are more of a just like, a, like an accent type of instrument. But in the mm-hmm. salsa music, it really is a driving force of the actual of the actual genre you know itself the style it's it's got to be really strong so the way i mic them is that first of all in the timbales you have two um shells right they look like toms but they have an empty um they don't have a, a skin under so it's only like a top drum head so the, the, the bottom drum head doesn't exist so it's just like a, it's a hollow and then you have um it's usually made uh, from stainless steel but you have like brass ones or whatever i i like to use stainless steel it's my favorite type of sound and and then you have um, cowbell. You have two cowbells. You have a cha cha bell. You have a mambo bell, and then you have a clave as well. And then you have um, either one or two cymbals. And so that that's the, in essence what it is. But then you can also add like a snare drum. I play with a snare drum a lot of times, and you can actually add another tom. So mic and a snare is pretty straightforward. A tom as well. But for the actual timbales itself, what I like to do is I like to use four twenty ones. So dynamic mics. So you can do fifty sevens as well but I like the 421s uh, and you put them under the shells, but you don't point them directly under it facing completely up. What you do is you kind of like put them at a, maybe um, uh, not almost a 45 degree angle, but um, it not, it's too much of his 45. So in between 45 and 90 degrees, you know, kind of like facing a little bit more of the shells because a lot of times in the music, you're not, you're not just banging on the drums on the top part. You're, you're actually playing the sides of the drums, which gives you like a shell-like sound, which co- it's just called the cascara sound. It's mm-hmm. called the cascara. Um, so you want to be able to point them a little out to, to really get that real nice cascara sound and still get a nice, decent sound from the actual drum itself when you're playing the, the actual drums, the drum heads. So the mics so, are inside the bottom of the drum, but they're pointed sort of at a 45-degree angle toward the sides in the top? Something like that? Kind, yes, 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 yes. And depending on how the drum sound, you could play with it, you know, bring them a little lower. You don't have to put them so in. 
depending on how it's tuned, mm -hmm. you know, you got to find what the perfect height is for you. And also, you know, make sure that there's no like phasing issues and stuff like that. And, you know, mic placement is very important in that sense. Um, and then for the um, actual cowbell itself, the mambo bell, the cha-cha bell, and the, and the actual, actual uh, clave, which has a term in Spanish, it's called the hierro. Hierro means, um, uh, how can I say hierro? It's kind of like hardware, you know, mm -hmm. hierro is hardware. So that's how they say it. So I like to use an actual Lewitt mic, um, which is a Lewitt mic that's actually discontinued. Um, and it's the Lewitt 450 LCT. It's my favorite mic for those cowbells for some reason. And I have, I have nice. other mics. I have like, I have Neumann, I have AKG 414. I have, you know, I obviously I have like dynamic mics and then I have, um, all sorts of mics. I have, I have also Lewitt like a 40 mic. I have the 640, the five, whatever. I have all of them. And the one that I like the best is actually one that they discontinue. So I'm like taking care of it. Like it's gold, you know, because I really love the way it sounds on it, man. Well, but sometimes, got, you know, you just find the right mic. Yeah. The Lewitts have a nice, um, you can switch patterns and switch the, um, low cuts and switch the pads on them, which is pretty cool. So you can really dial them in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a really, really great mic. And then I just use two overheads and you can really use any type of overheads that you like, but I like to use a uh, 414s as my overheads. And then on the so, snare, would you use a top and a bottom mic or not? Yeah, yeah, always top and bottom. Okay, so and I'm I'll looking, use fifty-seven. Spin. I'm uh, okay. I'm, I, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt. Sorry, I'm looking at um, the video here, and it looks like you've got a uh, two overheads. You've got a top and bottom on the snare. You got what I I can't see in the video, but you described it as two four twenty ones underneath the timbales looking up, and the Lewitt on the cowbell. So you got seven mics on a timbale kit. Um, which is, yes. it's great for you to break that down. Cause again, like, you know, if somebody walked in to do timbali overdubs on my session, I wouldn't necessarily know to put that many mics out there to get the right kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is like, if you, if, these are the little tricks that the hardcore salsettos, they understand because they, they've done it for so long and they know what the sound requires. Now, if I was doing a track, like if it was like a, maybe like more of a Carlos Santana type thing where it was like a cha-cha rock and the actual timbales didn't have such a strong importance in, in carrying the groove, then I could probably just use maybe even like just, you know, one mic on there and maybe an overhead and, and call it a day kind of thing. You know, you don't really need much because it's, it's, it's more of a, an additional type of, um, ingredient that is on top of all the other groove that's happening. But in the essence of salsa music, there is no drum set. So you you really are the, one of the most important elements within it. So that's why, for example, just the way you, you, you mic a drum set like hardcore, you know, you use mic, you mic every single little thing. It's the same type of approach with the timbali. Very cool. All right. Bill Cheney, the founder of Spectra 1964, kept getting the same question from customers. What DI should they use with the 610 series comp limiters? After trying to recommend various DIs while making excuses for the way they all sounded, he realized that the solution was to create the perfect direct input box himself. Thus, the BBDI passive direct box from Spectra 1964 was born. By using Spectra design concepts and standards, the BBDI provides a low distortion and flat response design that is unequal by any standard or measure. The absence of harmonic distortion and articulation of signal detail is readily apparent. This is all done with a passive transformer type design that will provide years of trouble-free operation. Simply put, the BBDI is the best sounding bass DI I've ever used. It'll move your pant leg. No hype, no color, just pure tone at spectra1964.com. If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com. 
Com, home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. Let's talk a little bit about instrumentation and arrangement also. So when you're doing the kind of music you're doing, salsa, um, what are some of the instruments and, and parts that you find are people should be aware of in terms of they're most likely to step on each other, these parts, and, and kind of mess up the sound? Are there, are there certain parts of the arrangement where you have to sort of be careful that you don't um, clutter things up? Uh, yeah, I mean... I would say like you have to be careful of not cluttering up all the time and it doesn't matter where part of the song what what part of the song you're talking about cuz every song is sort of different and it really depends on the melody a lot of times you know like what what your melody is and what spaces you have there's a lot of times that I've hear I've heard time and time again arrangements where like everything is sort of on top of the voice and then I've I've learned to be able to listen to music not like a musician but as, as just a spectator and and it's very important to understand that at the end of the day, like most of us instrumentalists are going to be listening to the, to instruments. We're going to be listening to all these little nuances happening with the harmony and stuff. But the majority of people are going to be listening to the lyric and trying to understand what it's actually saying, you know, and the message of the song. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. And I would say the beginning of the song is actually the more difficult part because that's where like the verses are and all that stuff. Once you, once you get into, um, you know, the structure of a salsa song, it's pretty interesting because when you look at a at a standard, you know, pop song or whatever, um, you know, you have like an intro, then you'll have, you know, your verse, you have your pre-hook, you have your hook, then you can go into another verse and then pre-hook hook again, maybe a little bridge, and then go into the hook and then you're out of the song already. But in the sense of a salsa song, it's all of that plus this part that we like to call coro y soneo, which is call and response, you know, chorus. Um, and, and this is where the singer likes to improvise. And then you have all this crazy horn stuff happening and like, maybe like a solo. So it's, it kind of has like more of, a um, a big band jazz type of format, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, you gotta be able to understand this and to tastefully put it all together. So the song doesn't feel like, first of all, it doesn't feel so long. It also has like a sort of a surprise element every time. Um, and then know when to actually get super busy and when not to be super busy. Right. So I would say like, you know, the, the beginning is, is hard because we want to try to get people up in their chairs and start, start dancing. But sometimes you want to be a little bit more mellow during that section, because you know that later on in the song, you're going to need like to put in a lot of crazy flavor right. and stuff like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I always, so, um. I always described mixes that way in the studio as like the long triangle where you have, you know, the, they're, they're the hardest ones where you have to start out with fewer elements and then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and louder and louder till the end. And, and it's very tricky to figure out, like you said, where do you start? Where do you, how do you get settled in? Cause you don't want to lose exactly. people's interest. Exactly. Um, well, so what about, um, you know, what about that process? What about getting to that outro helps you out? Is it just simply, um, is it like in country music where they chart out a song and they say, fiddle takes solo here, guitar will do the solo here, and, and you just sort of plan out a rough map of who's going to play which parts, or is it some of it improvised? Um, you know, what I usually like to do is, I like to write out my arrangements almost... Um, in its completion, like, like, like completely sort of thought out and every single horn line sort of written out, you know, orchestrated really old school style, you know, like how, when, you know, Quincy Jones would come into like a Frank Sinatra session, you know what I mean? And everybody, every musician will know what they're going to have to do. And then just, you know, you, you don't want to waste tape, you know what I mean? So like, you mm -hmm. want to just nail it. Um, that's the way I like to work because I come from more of a, a band oriented, um, uh, upbringing, you know, I played in a lot of bands. I played in, in big bands in scholarly bands, education, you know, classical music and all that stuff. So that's sort of, um, how I like to work. However, 
there's always definitely moments in time where you want to leave it up to interpretation. And um, I always change stuff around in the studio with the music. So even though it's written out or whatever, and I hear I hear it being played because something something is programming, you know, like a horn line, and then sometimes it's actually playing it. And some things that you program with a keyboard are almost impossible to play with a trumpet. Mm. So then in that situation, the trumpet player will be like, "Well, this is like it's cool and everything, and I can do it, but chances are every time you play it live, it's never going to happen." So then you're like, "Okay, what other options do we have?" And then yeah. you start working it out with the musician, and then you sort of find the compromise. Yeah, I've heard, uh, I remember my brother arranging a vocal choral ensemble once, and same thing, he had arranged it on the piano, and then when he heard the voices, he realized there's a whole bunch of things you don't realize until you have the voices in front of you to know what yeah, you really for can sure. and can't do. Um, yes. Now, what about for those of us who are fascinated by this, we want to do something that's, you know, that's salsa-oriented, or we want to we go for it and do some sort of production like this, um, but we don't know how to arrange stuff like you do. Do you have advice for people? Do you, do you tell them, you know, it's just, it's not possible for you to do a song that way? Or do you say, no, this is what you need to do. You need to hire somebody who can arrange it for you. How does that work? Yeah, man, I always tell people that a producer is not the ultimate arranger, orchestrator guy, you know, like that's not what your role it truly is. I mean, you can be, and a lot of times you are, so that is is that but it's not necessarily like for example there's a lot of great engineers that i know that are producers like the great umberto gatica you know he's an amazing producer engineer he doesn't arrange the music but he knows how to put the team together you know and he gets like and he knows what works you know what i mean like he'll be able to tell the arranger what he's looking for what type of sounds what type of orchestration he he is like envisioning and then the arranger will do the job so you know, and then you look at guys like DJ Khaled, who is um a guy that's just like more like um a visionary, you know, um very talented um guy to put together talent and songs and write maybe some great hooks here and there. But he himself says it, you know, he has a lot of ghost producers right now working for him and he but he makes the hit records, you know what I mean? So that's hey, that's the that's the way it is. It works. Right. If it works, so, it works. It works, it works, it works, man. It doesn't matter. Like he's a brand now and he's very successful and and he should be applauded for the hard work he's put in because just because you don't program the music or write the notes on paper doesn't mean that you're not working hard. You know what I mean? You can be working right. on other things. Actually, in my in my daily work, I probably spend about um I don't know, 10% on music and the rest on other stuff and like podcast interviews. And, and it's just the way it is. <laughs> podcast interviews, you know. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, man. You know, you just have to be doing marketing. You got to get your music out there. You got to be doing like, you know, you got to be in charge. Of what, what's your next design? Like right now I'm doing like a whole like influencer thing with McDonald's. You know, I'm doing like a commercial thing. And wow. um, yes, yesterday I did like, a, you know, now, they're ha now they have like virtual events. So like, you know, it's crazy. They, they wanted to hire me for their, um, it's called their, it's like their, you know, holiday corporate party or whatever. And usually I would do it every year performing, but because they can't perform, they're going to have a zoom holiday party. Right. So they want me, they wanted me to like pre-record some like, you know, hype messages, you know, to get people like, you know, hyped up. And then they were going to play some of my music, some of my videos through the zoom for people to like, just enjoy. And I'm like, like, Okay, <laughs> this is weird, fun, but hey, man. you know, let's do it. Let's make it happen. So, so you never know, man. You just gotta, you gotta be creative, and you have to just work hard and know where your forte is. Like, if you if you feel like your forte is not in arranging music, um, then get the best arranger that you know, and and just guide the whole process. You're still gonna be the producer, you know, and the producer is the person that makes sure that from A to Z. Everything is covered. So I'm glad you brought up the videos too, and and also just you know doing the marketing and getting yourself out there and the promotion. Um, you've got some great videos. Um, we've included uh, your videos in a playlist for the rock stars to so go check this out and listen to your music. But I mean, like you ha you have videos like um, let's see the um, 
Kim Barakon, uh, Bemba Colora featuring Chachi, yeah. two two point two million views. Uh, the Billy Jean video, three point eight million views. Uh, what have you learned about making videos that um, you know get get watched? Um, you know, I I feel like it's always um, a matter of trying to 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 keep creating content and what will stick will stick you know that's my opinion like you just never know what video is going to actually be the one that's going to take off when i when i released that billy jean video i didn't think about analytics i didn't think about anything man i was just like oh man this is a cool video we just did a series xm i'm just going to upload it i think i uploaded it like sunday night you know i was like whatever you know Uh and all of a sudden man it started picking up speed like crazy dude i was like yo what's this and you know, and Facebook, man, it, it really took off. In sp- Facebook, it, it got like five million views in like a month. It was wow. crazy, you know. So, you know, and then I uploaded it to. I actually uploaded it first to Facebook, and then I uploaded it to YouTube. And YouTube was like, P- this, this, the YouTube is like the rerun. So those three million views are like reruns from like Facebook, but Facebook really exploded. And actually, that okay. was the video that that helped me reach the number one um, sales uh, on Latin billboard charts for my album because it went viral, man. It just went completely viral. And so you never know. And 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 the thing is, it's, it's the continuity. It's being able to be persistent and to be able to, to really um, throw content to your fans, to people, and do it in the best quality format possible. And I have a lot of guys that I like to watch on YouTube that inspire me, whether they are musicians or even vloggers. So I upload like some vlogs too. Like I did like a little COVID vlog because I got COVID and stuff. And if you know, people enjoy that stuff. At the end of the day, like I said, you're a brand and you got to like, like sort of handle it as such because, mm-hmm. you know, people are going to relate to you. And that's very important. It's very important for people to relate to you and for you to inspire them in a positive way. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, well, and congratulations on getting on recovering from that. We're glad you're healthy and well and able to join us today. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, thank you. The secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier fire circuit, extremely low self noise and transformer coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five year warranty, free shipping to the US and a 30 day money back guarantee. Plus for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jayzmike.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins and pre-sona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. All right, let's see. What, what else do we want to keep talking about? Um, let's talk about working with musicians. Um, when you're bringing in these great musicians, you know, you're doing arrangements with uh, big horn sections. And, um, and I guess... How often do you have like the whole enchilada to just use that term? How how often is the whole enchilada in the studio or is are you often building these productions with just a section at a time? Um it depends on the production. Sometimes sometimes I get everybody involved <clears throat> um at the same time if it's like a big band or something. Um so so, you know, it's, it really depends on the project. I like to do things 
um, when it's the salsa format in sections, definitely in sections. I feel like it's a lot more organized. Mm. But when you're talking about jazz and stuff like that, I mean, it's always better to do everybody in a room because it's so, it's the way the genre was made, you know, it's the way it should be. Yeah. So you can't really, you can't really mess with that, you know, and the salsa music is a little more commercial and, you know, it, it it's, it's a lot easier to handle like, that way. But I think like, um, it really depends on the project. Yeah. I would well, say. It's interesting to, for, to hear you say that salsa is easier to do it in sections because maybe it allows you to focus on the precision of the groove and layer things carefully or something. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. However, if you look at my, my Billie Jean video and you look at the videos that have gone more viral per se or have the most use, they're all live videos. And they're completely live. Like this is not overdubbing nothing. Like this is recorded, and what happened there is just what you're hearing, you know, in the in the mix. So, I would have to say that um, it is very effective to record live, and there's some magic about it, and people really enjoy it. People yeah. really, really enjoy it. They're the, the organic nature of it. So, although like you know we're used to Spotify and we're and, and we're used to like the perfection. Sometimes these imperfections is what makes it for the for the public for their for their for their for their vibe. Um, so now, when you do have a band like that, um, how do you keep the band happy in the studio? How do you keep everybody focused and doing their best work? Um, <clears throat> it was a bit of a trick question. It was a bit of a trick question because I remember your answer when we did the uh, workshop together, the webinar a while ago. I think oh, you yeah. said, <laughs> I think you said you feed them really well, right? Yeah, the, the most important thing, food. Food. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the most important things is definitely the food. You know, keep everybody like not hungry. It's very important. You know, yeah, they'll yeah. they'll be happy. They'll, they'll they'll have a good time. But it's 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 a tough job, man. You know, it's a tough job to to hurdle all the guys, and especially if you're on a tight budget, because then you you end up having to do a lot of stuff yourself, or you're based off people like just volunteering and helping. So you can't mm -hmm. really like force them to do stuff so hardcore, you know? Right. So it's a lot harder, man. And it's more expensive too. I find that sometimes for me, one of the challenges when I'm trying to coordinate a lot of things is, um, sticking to my, you know, figuring out what my one job is and sticking to that and not accidentally getting pulled into like five other jobs at the same time, you know, as the, if I'm the studio guy and I'm the engineer and I'm the producer and I have to make sure everybody pulls in and parks properly and all that kind of stuff, it just, it feels like a lot of distractions. Although I don't ever record yes. a band as big as yours, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, it's hard, man, for sure. So what about knowing when you've got the take? What about that aspect of it? How do you feel like you know when you've got um, the right take and... um is it different from recording a band in the studio and just kind of you do a few takes and you think we can edit that? Or are you trying to go for a real performance? Um, you know, knowing that you have the right take is by feeling. It's by, it's by kind of like if you get those goosebumps, you know what I mean? Like you're just like, dude, this is the one. You know, like it, it's kind of hard to say. Although I'm a very like play it safe type of guy. So I would like to have like some options here and there. You know, just to have as an alternate take or something like that. But when, when you have it, man, you kind of feel it. You know, you're like, man, this is, this is so fire. You know, and and you got to know when to say, okay, this is it. Because if not, then you'll be there forever. You know, and yeah, and 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 music is not about perfection. I go back to the same thing. It's not about perfection. It's about the feeling. It's about the, the delivery. And one time I worked with um, Bruce Wedeen, which is Michael Jackson's co-producer, legendary mm. engineer, yeah. and he always told me, he's like, man. If there ever came a time to where I recorded something wrong, which he said he'll never do because he's not like that. <laughs> I was like, wow. He said, I would always choose the music over the, the sonic sound. So like if there was a take that sounded sonically, maybe not as good as another one, but it delivered a better, a better like feeling or performance, he would always choose that over, over the sonic quality of the sound. So and coming from an engineer, that's something very big. So that stuck to me a lot. And it made me realize that it's so important to to make sure that we deliver, you know, that take and then just feel it for what it is and 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 be happy with it, be content with it, and just keep moving forward. That's very cool. What did you um, work on with Bruce? 
Well, he makes two songs in the Michael Jackson tribute record that I did. Oh, no duh, right? <laughs> I probably could have answered that question myself. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course. He's the Michael Jackson. Yeah. Um, well, very cool, man. Um, okay, let me let me ask you a t- sort of a technical question around this and around performing, because your stuff is so groove-based, and we live in a world of, you know, um, high, you know, expensive recording studio setups, but also very affordable home recording studio setups. Um, and with the home studio setups, you you can easily run into latency problems. How do you manage that? Do you have you have you felt like latency and computing um, or recording digitally can screw up your process at all? And and anything any lessons you've learned there? Um, you know, latency is definitely something that bothers me. You know, and it always comes up because, especially when I'm recording like a timbali or something, when I have like a lot of inputs coming in, and and it's a and, and remember. I always record timbales last. So the, the the projects, and I'm recording at 96 a lot of the time. So mm-hmm. if I have like a project that has a bunch of plugins and all this stuff, like, and then I get lazy to 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 print out stems to record the timbales, I'll try to record, you know, on the actual session and I'll have all sorts of latency issues because of all the plugins that are enabled, all the tracks that are in the song, you know. So um, it, it's always, I, I've learned already now to like, make, you know, stems for recording stuff whenever I have like already a massive session because it makes latency just a lot less. I feel like right. when you have a lot of like a lot of stuff processing, I mean, no matter how fast your computer is, bro, there's always going to be something. There's, it's just, I don't know what it is. It's like, it's just the computer sometimes doesn't know how to handle everything well. And, and latency is such a, it's a pain, bro. It's like a little rock in your shoe. You yeah, know what I mean? Is. Like you, yeah. you can't, you can't play. You can't. You, and even if it's a slight second off, or I mean, slight millisecond off, and you can't really notice it, but you feel it, and you're like, "Hey, wait a minute!" That and you play right. You're playing. You're recording, and then you play it back, and you're like, "Why am I a little bit like, like laggy, or why am I like on top of the beat?" Mm-hmm. And then you're like, "Okay, you know what? Let's close the session, guys. Print out stems. Open it back up." record and then you're like okay yeah that's why so that's good advice man just to reminding us that uh, we may i think sometimes as engineers we think about committing tracks because we're like oh we'll get more computing power but we forget that this basic idea of like print your tracks so that you just have nothing but um raw tracks and and a balance in your mix so that the computer is just like has no latency or the least amount possible and it, and it, yeah. you just get that confidence of playing to it because I agree with you. It just it makes me so angry if I am in the studio and I all of a sudden have this element of doubt about whether the timing is getting screwed within a recording. It just pisses me yes. off, you know. <laughs> no, of course, man. It, it's so frustrating, and I've learned, you know, because of my own mistakes that it's just better. It's more. It's better to 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 spend the time, you know, preparing for the session, knowing who's going to come in, and knowing you know, how to handle it. And even if people, you know, like if you've you've recorded a lot of stuff and you need to print something, like have everybody take a break, it's just better because you don't look bad because you're, you know what you're doing, but you look worse if you're like, okay, guys, I start recording and then you start getting all these issues and you're like, what's wrong with your studio? Like what's, what's happening? You know what I mean? Like, right. It's just that way. Um, I would just rather play it safe all the time. All right. So now here's another question, um, different direction, but um, do you know uh, the, the record Colossal Head by Los Lobos. So are you familiar no. with that one? Okay, amazing record. Um, goes back to, uh, I, I can't remember if it goes all the way back to the 80s or just or early 90s, but um, with Mitchell Froome and Chad Blake. And, and it's just really creative, unusual sounds. Um, and obviously Los Lobos has you know, uh, got a combination of rock band and, and some Latino instrumentation and grooves. But um, I wanted to, wondered how much of you know creative recording techniques you feel like is part of what you're doing. Um, do you feel like you there's many, much opportunity to sort of transform the sound through the studio, or do you feel like you're usually just trying to capture it with a realistic, you know, not not mess it up kind of version? Well, it really depends on what the 
producers thinking about. I mean, you can go either way with it, right? Um, for the for the you know for the for the stuff that I'm doing, it's very acoustic. You always want to try to commit to recording the stuff as as organically as possible because that's what the style of music is. However, there's a lot of times that I've worked with my brother that's a producer and DJ too, and I want to get like maybe some vocal chopping up and he'll just do add some crazy like effects and stuff like that. Or even have a guitar player that he has like a bunch of pedals and you just start like manipulating sounds until we come up with something pretty interesting for like a, for an intro or, or for whatever the case may be, you know, if, if I want to do like maybe some sound design in the, in the actual song, or even if it's like for a film type project, then we start getting really, really creative, you know, kind of like what, um, they do in film scoring and um those guys are really genius because a lot of times they'll do the most simplest thing but they'll they'll like really tweak or they'll go out in the field and record like really um out of the ordinary things and then put them into like pro tools and just make amazing sounds yeah. out of it that yeah that connects with that connects with the film and connects with the viewer, you know, it, 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 it enables other emotions. So you have to be definitely open to doing things and it all depends on the actual project and what it is, you know? Um, but for, for sure, for me, uh, in my, in my context and sort of in the, in the, in the work line that I do most of the time, I'm just trying to capture the instruments for what they are. Right, because you're you're trying to you you're, you're talking about the power of the timbales and how you're just trying to translate that powerful quality into the production for salsa because it's such an integral part of the groove. Exactly. Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Okay, so um, what about mixing? Is mixing a big part of your process? Do you like to work with other people on mixes? Um, and if you are doing a bunch of mixing yourself, do you have sort of a, a, a template or a way that you generally approach mixes to get the right sound? Well, I don't really actually do my own mixes unless it's something like a live thing. I'll, I'll do it for like a YouTube video or something like that. But when it comes to releasing my records and stuff like that, I don't mix it myself. I like to mix it with... Um, different engineers depending on the song, but I'm very, very involved in the process of the mix. So, you know, sometimes I'll be sending my mix engineers like six pages of mix notes and stuff and they want to kill me. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a part of the process. Um, and I've recently I've been working with this guy named Alfredo Mateus, which uh, mixed my Mazda Mi album. And I really enjoy his approach to um, his you know, I've, I've worked with people that love compression and I love with people, I've worked with people like Bruce Rudin that never use compression. Right. Right. So it's hard to say what I really love. I mean, everybody has their own, um, way of reaching the end result. And that's the cool part, you know, that there really is no path to like the, the successful sound and everybody has their own sort of way of doing it. And I know Alfredo has his little templates and stuff and he really compresses a lot of stuff. And I was always against that after working with Bruce, but then after finally mixing with this guy and seeing how he uses it, it's just like he has the perfect like ratio and release time. And it's like so good, man. It's so good that it it really impresses me every time. I love it, man. Well, um, all right. What about more of your studio setup too? Um, I think you had one of the videos you sent was, I think you were showing off um, the OWC Thunderbolt dock for hooking things up. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the 
elements that you've got in your home studio setup that work really well for you? Some of your favorite gear? Yeah, for sure. Um, OWC for me is um, one of the greatest companies out there, man, because they make great products for Mac and I'm a Mac lover and they make all sorts of gadgets to make um, things work a lot faster. Yeah. And I have a Thunderbolt 3 dock that I love because right now I'm working with a laptop set up in my, in my home, home studio, like not the studio, my parents' house, but in my apartment. And because I have to move around my laptop a lot of times, so I'll have my laptop and then I'll just connect that one cable, that Thunderbolt 3 cable to my Thunderbolt 3 dock. And then I have everything sort of connected to it. Then I also have an Aikido node Titan, which is, um, an external GPU enclosure. So I have an AMD 5700 XT in there. So when I video edit, you know, I have a lot more horsepower for renders and, and rendering is a lot less time now, which is Wait, great. So let me, let me see if I understand it. So it's not a hard drive. It's, or it's not an extra drive storage. It's extra graphics processing or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an external GPU, um, as if it was going to be for like a PC but you just put it into an enclosure and it has a Thunderbolt 3 connector. And what it does is like it's eight gigabyte GPU versus my four gigabyte GPU that's in my computer already. I see. So yeah, you get a lot more horsepower and, and it runs great, man. It runs and, so and smooth. And that'll, that'll just daisy chain right off of the out of the Thunderbolt dock? Mm-hmm. What are some other things? Like, I mean, you know, hearing about a dock like that sounds kind of cool, but it's kind of nice when you break down like, oh, I've got this connected, that connected. Like, what are some things that you actually connect to it that make m m would make somebody understand like, oh, this could be really useful? Yeah, for sure. Well, I I, def I have my, you know, my my external GPU connected to it. So it's just daisy chain to that. I also have my audio interface, which is a PreSonus um, Studio um, 26C interface, a small one. Okay, I don't cool. really do much stuff here, but just like mix or like, you know, post-production or, or just um, editing and stuff like that. Then I also have um, a bunch of USB hard drives connected to it. And um, I have a, an auxiliary output into, uh, which is the audio from the computer itself that comes out of that dock, it goes into a little pre-sonus uh, monitor station version two. So then I have my audio coming from my interface going into that um, monitor station and also audio coming from my computer. So if I am using Pro Tools, I can still like open Spotify and play it back, not using the audio interface, but using the actual audio from the computer, like the actual sound card from the computer. So and that's the, pretty cool. And that audio, does that audio come right out of the, the Thunderbolt dock or do you plug that into your computer or you get both options? No, it comes out of the, it, it comes out, yeah, both options. So I come out of the dock. So then I, I, it's clean, you know, it's a clean, I don't have to have a lot of stuff connected to my laptop is, is what I'm saying. It's like that it's all just connected to that dock. And that's then the true. dock itself, it, the dock itself charges my computer too, which is good. So I don't have to take out my like laptop charger either. No, that's, that's definitely handy being able to move maneuver so easily like that. What about um, is it um? Can you hot swap it, or do you have to sort of shut the computer down every time you want to disconnect the dock, or connect it? Uh, no, no. All you got to do is um, eject your drives. You know, whatever you have like connected. Um, so eject them so that they, you know, they they're ejected from the actual computer, and then you just disconnect it, and boom. Okay. You're good. All right. Cool. And then what about um? What about when it comes to stuff like backup? You know, do you have any stuff that you want to talk about, about um, how you back up your music? How do you make sure that you're not going to accidentally lose, lose stuff? What strategies have you learned? Well, you know, I, I've always, uh, whenever I have like a current project happening, I'll back up to like an external hard drive, like just an normal external, I'll just drag and drop and, you know, like old school style. And then I also have um, a cloud-based storage that I use. It's called Backblaze. Um, and it's pretty neat, man, because it's, it's unlimited. So you can upload as much as, as, as much as you can upload, um, from any drive connected to your computer. So you choose the drives that you want to be uploading to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And that saved me a couple of times, actually. So it's actually very neat. Yeah. I, mean, I have three. I started using it too. Wow. That's cool. Uh, but it hasn't, I, it hasn't saved me yet, but it will save me when I need it to save me. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you know. Good thing is that it hasn't happened to you, man. But it did happen to me um, where 
uh, one of the guys that was using my studio, um, by mistake, he raised the folder with had audio files in it for a session. And then like, I wanted to kill him, but yeah. we were able to get it back through Backblaze. Yeah. Um, I, I'll share this story really quickly. Um, the, the time it happened to me was I was doing a work drive and then I had a backup drive and at the end of each day, I'd cop, I'd connect the backup drive and then I'd drag over our folder from today onto the backup drive and it would go over the old folder, um, that was on there. And then you're supposed to shut down and then in the morning, you know, disconnect the backup drive and start working on the main drive again. And we came in one morning and I was working with somebody else and he got the two drives mixed up and he didn't disconnect the old one. And he just opened up the folder in the backup drive and we worked on that all day. And so at the end of the day, then I took the drive, what I thought was the master one, and I copied it over and thereby deleting everything we had just done that day. So it would have been handy to have some extra backup at that point. So I know what you mean about that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, but you only got to do that oh, stuff man. once and then you never have to do it again, right? Exactly. Exactly. You learn, you learn from every experience, man. All right, Groovy. Well, so we're coming up to the end of the show here. Let me um, zip through a couple of quick questions and um, we'll get to the end. Um, when you started out in recording and doing music, what do you feel like was holding you back? Money, for sure. <laughs> it was like, you know, it gets expensive, bro. It gets expensive to to record and to to get projects done, you know, paying musicians, paying studio time and all that stuff and, or building out your own home studio. Money has always been, you know, a tough situation, but it makes it a lot, you know what? It makes the process so much funner because you have to get creative. You know, I remember when I was first starting out recording, I had to like put on my air mattress, you know, next to my team bodies and whatever, and like figure mm -hmm. out ways to, to get creative mic placements and, you know, using all sorts of mics and dealing with latency was one of big, one of my big issues as well. So, that's all part of the process and it makes you better. So um, enjoy the moments of the struggles, you know, enjoy the moments of like, you know, coming up and doing things yourself and all the failures and all the criticisms, you know, just take them, take them um, constructively and don't take them to heart. You know, you're always going to get better. And that's what this whole process is about. That's what life is about in general, you know, to yeah. learn from every experience and try to just keep pushing the bar up and being a better version of yourself. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, you, it, not everybody's going to be Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, it, you don't have to be Michael Jackson. You don't have to be the best in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's about just being the best that you, like you possibly can be in. And that's it, man. And then people are going to connect with that, man, because you're honest. You're being honest. That's great, man. I love that. That's great advice. Um, okay. Now what about something, um, to inspire for the business, maybe a resource or, um, you know, a tip for the business side of doing recording for those of us who want to do it for more than just a hobby. Yeah. Well, one of the more important things I, I think, um, a tip is that you find a way to really view this as a business, right? Cause a lot of times we're going to find ourselves uh, in a situation where we want to be like helping friends out and, and being a part of every type of project that we can just for the fun of it or whatever. But we're going to dilute ourselves and dilute our potential if we, we all do that all the time. So the way I found it was like, I had, I still don't have like, for example, a business manager, but I, I try to use like my dad, for example, to be sort of the liaison, you know, and, and, um, communicate like, in a way where, you know, everybody needs to get paid for it, for their time and make it a business, you know, like you can't be doing favors all the time. And so really, really understand it. Like as such, you know, um, treat this as like, you need to make profit in order to keep investing in your company, view yourself as an entrepreneur, as a brand, rather than just a, you know, this like, you know, um, just a musician, you know, or a creative person that gets inspired by whatever, you know, it's, it's much more than that, um, especially if you want to make it very far. You want to kind of live a sort of a successful life with it and, and be able to to make a decent living and stuff. So that's something that I've learned throughout the years, man. And um, just find find the right team, whether it's, you know, your significant other or your dad or somebody that's close 
and not always, um, uh, I would say, trust everybody that comes around that wants to quote unquote help you. you <laughs> yeah, know? there's there may be a that may be good advice here in Nashville traditionally too. You know, there's there's a you yeah. Can, I just picture the story of the the new person landing in town, the new songwriter. Next thing you know, they're having a meeting with somebody who's going to make it big for them. For yes, for exactly. a mere five or ten thousand um, dollars. Yeah, exactly. Well, cool, man. All right. Well, so let's here's the here's our closing question, Tony. Uh, we're going to take the way back studio machine, and you can go back and find young Tony playing timbales in the family band, which. That alone sounds like a lyric to a song. I'm not sure how the melody goes, but it should be one. <laughs> um, and you're going to go give yourself some advice. You say, listen, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the studio yourself one day. If you could go back and give yourself one bit of advice, what would you go do? What would you say? I would say to practice, man, because I never liked to practice. You know, I was always like, oh, I want to play soccer. And again, it was... And if I would have practiced, I would be such a better musician today. You know, like I, I feel like I'm good and I, I'm skillful and I've learned a lot and I'm very versatile. Um, but as far as like an actual instrumentalist, a lot of the time that you have as a young kid or as a, as a, as a teenager, um, you could become super good, super fast because your brain at that age just like really develops every technique, you know, so much faster. I, I find that at least because I, for example, if I try to practice now, it's not the same as if when I was like 18, 19 years old. So that's the best advice I would give myself. But then again, maybe I would not be as like cool and charismatic that I am now because I was always around like, you know, that party atmosphere and whatever, you know, so I don't know, man. I mean, I could probably like mess it up. Maybe I would, if I was practicing hardcore that way, then I would probably get bored. So I mean, I would, I would say it, but I would say at, at the same time, you know, have fun and, and be yourself. And at the end of the day, live life in the present, bro, because you never know what's going to happen in the future. I love it, man. Great, great advice, dude. Well, we've come to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for hanging with us again, Tony. Um, Rockstars, if you didn't get a chance to see Tony's workshop um, with us on how to make creative videos from your home studio with OWC, uh, we'll include a link to that in the show notes, too. Um, but thank you for joining us again on the podcast, man. It's been a super awesome time hanging out with you. No, thank you so much, man. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, man, let's just keep rocking forward, man. Let's um, do the rock stars in the studio. Yeah, that's right, man. Well, so let the rock stars know how they can go find you online. Where should they go listen to your music? What if they need to uh, come, you know, see your next show or, or uh, produce their next great salsa record? Yeah, most definitely. You can find me on my website, TonySucar.com, S-S-U-C-C-A-R. And you'll be able to find links to all my social media there as well. You find me on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram, TikTok, and all that stuff. So you can definitely find me there. And um, I love to connect with you all. And I'll be when, when shows do come back, <laughs> I'll be able to post when they will be um, there. Awesome, man. Well, hopefully soon, dude. Thanks so much, man. And, and um, stay well, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. All right, man. Cheers. Talk to you. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music.
Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who help make this episode possible. Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to get your free mastering demo at soundporter.com and use the coupon codes ROCK10 at Isotope for an additional 10% off and ROCKSTARS at jzmic.com for 50% off the BB29 for a limited time. Time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to give a big thank you to our rock star team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Weselchenko, Braden Streming, and Hugh McDonald for additional podcast and video production. You guys rock. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.